people, I would suggest that if you did that, you would be able to say yes and be affirmed. I'm just going to keep crying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm starting to cry. Oh, yeah. so, go ahead. Can I say what? I can function. I'm fine. Yeah. But don't You're worry really. about me. I'm going to keep crying. Oh, good. Moving it out. Yeah, moving it. That's right. Can I say something? I mean, um, do you personally believe that modernity is inevitable? I mean, as far as my family is concerned, I believe it's inevitable because I have, my family has a very sketchy past. My grandfather died in the Soviet Gulag. My other grandfather was a Klansman. My, no. <laughs> yes. Yeah. My other grandfather was a Klansman. But yet, my father married a Roman Catholic who had a daughter who had uh, bilingual, who, who had uh, biracial children. So, I guess my family's success story, do you believe modernity is, 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 is as inevitable as my family? Well, uh, I, the, the answer uh, for me, and I think I can say this for educated people, is that we're in modernity. Okay. okay? And so, um, as a matter of fact, that is the fact. And um, the way I teach it in, in, at Canisius is there was um, the Neolithic Revolution is a set of conditions that lead to what we call civilization. The Industrial Revolution is a set of conditions that lead to what we call modernity. So we are in modernity. The academic argument is over whether or not we're in post modernity. Oh, okay. okay. And to that, to answer that question, do I think we're in post-modernity? And I'll answer it this way. Um, I think uh, I agree with Anthony Appia, who said, uh, uh, Professor Appia said in a book he put out in 1992 in my father's house, that um, uh, ever since after World War II, we've been in a post-colonial age. So I don't know if we've reached post-modernity yet, but I know that we are post-colonial. And I think that's very relevant to the Occupy movement because what we want is we want self-possession. We want to actually have sovereignty over our country. And we don't have sovereignty over our country. Now in the post-colonial age, the colonial powers recognized that they had to recognize the sovereignty of colonized peoples. We're still coming to terms with that recognition. So I think we're in a post-colonial age. If you want to call that postmodern, I might agree, but I, 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 I'm confident in the answer that we are postmodern. Thanks, Questions on the talk. Thank you. Um, so, please. no, no, that was related. I think, exactly. I think, I think that was related um, because this is universal history, right? And where are we in history? Where are we now? Um, I think the boys' idea that I'm co-signing this idea that universal history involves us um, having an inclusive concept of universal history rather than top down. Right. That's the basic idea here. And that's what I'm saying about the narrative of justice. So the more inclusive we can be towards different people is the more we'll be closer to achieving that universal history. Just to, uh, uh, right off that topic, it made me think about how we teach history, how, you know, who controls the, what is the definition of history? You think about textbooks, you know, and the politics behind how the you know the education is defined or delivered in curriculums. And it makes me think of Texas. You know, I think one yeah. of the what really relates to Occupy movement is how do we occupy our history? Our, our yeah. how do we occupy history? <laughs> occupy the telling of history. Yeah. You know, because definitions of peoples is very you know yeah absolutely you know that's how right there I'm if i can jump off from that yeah, point yeah with relation to w.e.b du bois okay du bois made it his life's work to give agency to 
black people. Mm -hmm. So, The Souls of Black Folk is an important work, but that was the start of his life's work. Mm -hmm. He then went on to do the Niagara Movement, he then went on to do edit, ed, the NAACP, he then went on to uh, edit the Crisis Magazine for the NAACP, mm -hmm. and in his role as a professor, he was trained in economics, in, so in sociology. He did one of the first um, studies of an urban, of an urban population, the Philadelphia Negro. He went door to door in the Philadelphia um, black community. And he interviewed every household. Wow. So um, it's not just so you get based it in fact and not yes. in stereotype. But what he wanted to do was correct. Mm -hmm. the way black people were being represented mm -hmm. in history. So his grand work is called Black Reconstruction. In 1935, he wrote this history of the Reconstruction era. And he told a story that gave agency, you know, to people who really were treated as things. Really, he really tells the story in a way that's powerful because it was, you know, it was reading that book that I became aware of the problem of Southern planters and the fact that in our Constitution we gave the planters more power than other citizens. And it's funny because it's invisible. We talk about things, we talk about the Three-Fifths Compromise, and we know that it was a slight against the humanity of black people. But how many people recognize the Three-Fifths Compromise was a slight against the democratic power of white people? How many people appreciate that? Let me break it down for you. I got it from Du Bois, he explained it to me in Black Reconstruction. The planters are the owners not only do they have the power of voting and recognize that there was a property requirement in the day of our Constitution, so everyone did not vote. You had to have some property, some skin in the game, in order to vote, okay? But what about these people who were property? Not only do they not get to vote, but because they're property and because they get counted as three-fifths a person, the people who own them have more people that he has control over economically, mm -hmm. and he has more in the census count that go <laughs> towards determining congressional representation. Right. So when that congressional representative goes now to represent the people in his district, he has to give more power and credence to the planter to the person who is the owner of more of the lives of the people in his district. They were counted for that representative to exist. And so that those representatives have to give more heat and, and, and time and credence to the planter. The, the people who are white and don't have property don't have the right to vote, and they should be ignored by their representatives if you're following me. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's how okay. it was. So it's only until black people got the, got the franchise that many of these white, poor people were enfranchised. Right. White people without property did not get to vote until black people got to vote. Mm -hmm. You must appreciate that. Yes. Most yes. of us don't. Yes. In, in the West, it wasn't until 1848, the 1848 revolutions, that France gave adult males a universal right to vote. So in the West, it wasn't until 1848 that there was any nation where there was universal suffrage for a class. And then we've been expanding, so this is a crucial issue of, more of, 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 of the narrative of justice and whether or not we really have a universal history or not. Who, who would count as the victors of history or not? Uh, so, Du Bois made this point that there are black actors who push the events that have to be considered not only as you might consider um, factories 
in a, a historical narrative, right? But as you consider human beings who do things to determine their their fate and the fate of others, mm -hmm. so I think that um, we're struggling with that. How do we give people a voice so they can appear in history? Mm -hmm. uh, I hope I answered your question. I don't know. Maybe one of these. It take it takes it. You du you dug into it in a deeper way because I was really thinking also about not just who's who is in charge of creating these stories that we tell to children you right. know well, you that's what I'm talking about right? text oh, yeah. the way they were Thomas yeah. Jefferson yeah. So, like, good anymore. You're, talking about, so you're talking about the deeper root of that like you know the people who are actually making the history now we're talking about how is history framed for control right. of yeah, people you're talking about the, the, the political process of writing a curriculum Exactly. And mm -hmm. what gets into the curriculum? What gets into right. the history books that we teach our because uh, primary people, school kids? You could make something totally invisible by not including it, you know, or you could make it visible by saying he or she instead, you know, making some of the kids' names Abdul or something. You know, a lot of curriculum and textbooks are trying to be inclusive in that way, but there's a real insidious danger of that. Um, you know, like evolution being written out of, right, you know, right, right. Yeah. out of these things. So that's what I was trying to bring into it. I, I'm sitting here with the CF for one thing, and I, I, I hope. While it is the case that I understand and agree with everything that you're saying, there is something else that has to be, I think, brought into it. And again, it's part of telling our story, all of ours. While it is, it was the case that black men were counted as three-fifths of a person all women were not yeah. counted as people at all. Mm -hmm. We were property, and we were property until we were given the right to vote in 1919. So yes, again, yeah. when we talk about where things are and who this is, it has to be said to, and I don't think this is divisive, it's simply adding another piece to that puzzle. So why would this the case that there were, there were lots of people's voices who were stifled? And when we talk about race, what we have to, I think, acknowledge first is that we are talking about men of different colors and then of women of different colors. And as you had said, with determining whether we are modern or postmodernist, there is an argument to be made that as it is the case that all of us have equal rights and equal voices. This may be why we're at the point where we can talk about what you were saying was all of us being recognized versus race and gender. Um, I'd like to just um, add a little something. Um, this is in regards to uh, The moral philosophy of everything that we have discussed tonight, um, there's definitely a, a role that religion plays, and there's definitely a role that, um, you know, whether it's putting another group against another group, um, but most of the theories, most of the injustices, and most of the uh, discrimination is political and economic. Uh, the reason being is that the cost of production, um, and wages, uh, if, if, if women are considered to be non-humans, they don't have to be paid. If black people are considered to be three-fifths or non-humans, they, they don't have to be paid. And A is wages, and B is cost of production then we have to somehow reduce A in order for it to equal the cost of production for mm. society to balance itself out. Unfortunately, and that's economic. Unfor and then the people that are in the circumstances that are in the non-human uh, categorized era um, or area, they are then treated uh, differently and so they also act differently which creates a different structure of moral fiber. fiber. 
as the you know with the as the as Ben Franklin says the empty money sack it's very difficult to stand up straight and when what's that the empty money sack it's difficult to stand up straight um, and so one of the things that I, I, I think is important is not only the moral um, and the philosophy behind it, but how economics uh, works on that moral philosophy as well. Um, it's just something that I, I can't help but think about is because when, when they say that the history is made and written by people who are in power, it, they do so, I think, in order to keep people in that mindset universally around the world rather than seeing everybody as an equal, people are able to look at people in Chinese sweatshops as that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that in our country, when we were an industrial age, A, which is wages, plus B, the cost of production and <coughs> wages together. So cost of production plus wages will never equal A. A plus B will never equal A. And so, that's why we continue to go further and further into a deficit. Um, and it's impossible to pay 